My heart is to see God's people full of passion and the fire of God, hungry for His presence on a daily basis, full of His power and having a positive impact on the world and those around them, living a life of freedom and victory. This is Running With Fire. Thanks for joining me today. You'll find that successful people, high achievers, top sports people have something in common. They seem to have this inner fuel, passion, and motivation that seems to drive them. These people don't have to be forced and pushed along. They seem to be able to sacrifice, do what it takes to succeed without having external pressure put on them. It's something they have within them that drives them. Today, I wanna look at having that kind of fuel, that kind of passion in your life to love and serve God. Stay tuned. So how are you at losing things? I'm amazed at how easy it is to lose the remote for the TV. How many places can there be in one room just to lose the remote? But it does happen. What about keys? I lost a set of keys in Wong Mata and had to travel hundreds of kilometers to get a replacement set of keys. Some people go out and lose their kids. They go out with four kids. Return home with three. Forgot to do a count. What about <coughs> losing socks? You look for your socks, you can't find them. Your wife says, my wife says, look in the top drawer. I do. I say, they're not there. She comes up, has a look and says, what are these? <laughs> I said, they weren't there when I looked. Adrian says, it's not by chance that the lost coin in scripture was found by a woman. <laughs> I hate losing things. And I'm sure you too as well. But the thing I would hate losing more than anything else would be a passion and a hunger for God. The fire of God. The most valuable possession you have on planet Earth is your hunger and your heart for God. More important than your job, more important than your home, your career, even your family. More important than anything else is your heart for God. If you, there's one thing you must never lose by the grace of God, and that is a fire and a zeal for the Lord Jesus Christ. But the worst loss of all is to lose God entirely. Come with me to Luke chapter 2, verse 41 to 46, for an interesting passage of Scripture. Luke chapter 2. His parents, it's Jesus' parents, went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother did not know it. In other words, they didn't realize that Jesus was no longer with them. But supposing him to have been in the company, see, they just presumed Jesus was still nearby. He was in their company, that all was well. But it wasn't well. They realized that and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Imagine that. You're entrusted with looking after the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and you lose him. <laughs> that was a bad day at the office for Joseph and Mary, I tell you now. But it is possible that to lose Jesus, and it can happen to any one of us. They didn't realize he was no longer near to them. General Booth, that great general, of the Salvation Army, did such a mighty work. He's on his deathbed. Some of the disciples gather around him, and they're sort of thinking, well, here's the great general. Maybe he's got some final words of advice, counsel for us as disciples that we can also have an impact for God. Were there any deathbed statements that burned in the heart of the great general? And there were. And this is what he said. He said, tend to the fire. For the nature of fire is to go out. Wow. We have to diligently guard God's fire and passion in our hearts. Romans 12, 11 in the NISV puts it this way. It says, never be lacking in zeal. Never. But keep your spiritual fire. Come on, never. He said, never, this is a, a command, a statement from Scripture, from the Holy Spirit, never be lacking in zeal, not for a year, 
Not for a month, not for a week, not for a day, not for an hour. Some people say, well, I had plenty of zeal last week. I'm a bit low this week, but hey, I'll be all right next week. No, 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 friends. Never, according to Scripture, be lacking in zeal. Maintaining the fire is our responsibility. It's not God's. It's not other people's. It's purely ours. Many of you have lit fires over the years, you know, maybe in your house, maybe at a barbecue or whatever. If you still do the old style with the sticks. If you don't watch that fire, guess what? You know, you, do, you just put, get the fire going, you disappear for half an hour, you're going to come back. The chances are the fire's gone out. And then you're going to be hard work to get the fire going again. Never let the fire in your heart go out. Diligently guard it. Add fuel when required. So here's my question to you, if I can ask graciously. How is the fire in your heart? How is your passion? On a scale of one to ten, where would you be? Would you be a nine? Would you be an eight, a seven, six, two, one? Trust there's no one like that there. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 19. This is now, it says this. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Well, that's an interesting statement, isn't it? It's like God comes to you and says, hey, hey, no, no, do not. Hey, don't do this. You're thinking, hey, I'll never do that. God is saying, don't do it. It means that you can do it. It's possible that you yourself somehow put out God's fire and zeal in your heart. Or you diminish it. So it's less than it was a year or two, three years ago. There's a possibility and a danger that the fire of God can, in our hearts can go down even die out, and worst of all, we can be the ones who actually put it out. I want to say this. Being passionate and on fire for God is not for a select few. Some of you say, oh, yeah, well, Pastor, you need to go up to Pakistan. You need some fire in your heart. You've been, you know. But hey, I'm just a, you know, just a church attender. I've got no big call on my life. I don't need much fire. Hey, this, that's just for a select few. Friends, so wrong. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Do you know why? Just as you were designed to breathe without effort. How many of you know you were created and born to breathe? Yeah, okay, well, a few of you know that. Some of you aren't sure. You were also created and designed by God to have a great hunger and zeal and passion for Him. It's not the abnormal, it's the normal. To not have the passion is the abnormal. Our normal way of living, it's our design, it's our destiny, it's what we were created for. We were created for God, friends. Let not the devil tell you, oh no, that's only for a few special people, they're going to be on fire, they're fanatics. No, no, they're normal. It's your destiny to be burning with fire for God. You were created for it. Don't let the devil rob you of it. So let me look at some causes of losing our passion. See if any of these have affected you. I hope not. First one may surprise you. It's success. Isn't it amazing? Success can make us unsuccessful. It's a breeding ground for complacency. Think of King David. Okay, David's at the height of his career. He's um, conquered many uh, enemies, won battle after battle after battle, and there he is in Jerusalem, successful. And at that moment, I don't know, maybe complacency set in because it's then that he committed adultery with Bathsheba. Success robbed him of passion for God. And friends, I've seen it over the years. People start getting successful. They start making money. They get a promotion at work, and then the promotion and the money overtake their lives, and their heart for God diminishes. They're less and less in church, and before you know it, the fire has almost gone out. Guard against success. Do you know, success in this life may be the most unsuccessful thing you ever experience. Because it can rob you of the most important thing in your life, which is your heart for God. And if success is going to lose your heart for God, say, God, please do not give me success. Please do not give me money if it's going to rob me of my passionate zeal for you. Anybody with me this morning? Number two, sin. Wages of sin is death. Worst sin of all, of course, is worst death is spiritual death. So guard against things like lying. You know, it's so easy to do. Ah, just a little white lie. Lie nevertheless. Complaining, stealing, cheating. Cheating in exams. Not paying your bills, your rent. Bad attitudes. Stealing work time. The list goes on. 
Number three, the busyness of life. How many of you are busy? Most hands will go up. We're busy. But you know, we get so busy, we're too busy for God. Too busy to serve Him. Too busy for church. Too busy to read the Bible. If that's you, then you are too busy. Change it. Make changes now. Today. For this day out, say, okay, I am making changes. My passion's not what it should be. I am going to do something about it. Part of it will be to join us this evening. Number four, let's go to Luke 8, 14. A lot of scriptures today. I hope you don't mind us using the Bible in church. Oh, I don't like that church. Too much Bible up there. Luke 8, 14. Now, the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked. The Word of God, the life of God is choked. How? With the cares of this life, riches, pleasures of life. Have any of those getting you? Cares, worries, anxieties. Robs us of fire and zeal. Pleasures, riches. Number five, where there's extreme suffering and sickness can really affect us. Those times you've got to guard the fire. It's when you've got to put in some extra fuel, go to an extra service, come to a few more prayer meetings, whatever. Get more into your word because you know you're in a dangerous position. There's a lot of sickness around. The fire can go out. See, the righteous friends run into the name of the Lord. So when trouble is abounding, you don't run away, you run too. Number six, ongoing trouble in the home or private life, marriage, family conflicts, financial pressure, personal struggles can lead to a a dimming down of our heart for God. Number seven, conflict with other believers. That's a big one. Conflict, you know, when you have conflict with other Christians, it's almost like, well, I can understand my conflict with non-Christians. Hey, this is my brother, my sister. Hey, how can we have conflict? Boy, that can really, really rob us of our heart for God because you think others shouldn't be happy. Number eight is failure of Christians we respected. It's big, isn't it? Our models. Could be young or old. Doesn't matter any age. They, they, they fall away and you think, oh, man, if they can't make it, probably I can't either. Even young people, they have role models they look to, even their, their peers, and if they fade away, it really can affect. You see, no man is an island. You don't sin alone. When we lose our fire, it's going to cause others to lose theirs. The reason I'm preaching this message is over recent weeks, God has stirred my heart with the words of this song that we will sing tonight. It's called, You Awaken Me. You Awaken Me. It came on the 24-7, You Awaken Me, and I suddenly I felt this, oh, God, you're going to awaken me afresh. Wow. I thought this is so cool. As I kept listening, went on to say, you're awakening our hearts to your kingdom. I said, oh, God, awaken my heart like never before. Then it says, we will sing aloud with all of our passion. Now, as I heard those words, I said, God, help me. Help me to sing aloud with all of my passion. That'll be so intensely in love with you that you won't be able to hold me back singing with fervor. Not how great is our God. How great is our God. Sing aloud with all of your passion. Let the Spirit of God apprehend your life like never before. And it finishes by saying, come like you promised, come fall upon us. There's been prophetic words around the world that there's coming a baptism of fire. Two purposes. One, cleansing, removal of dross and sin. Two, setting us ablaze for God. I'm ready for a baptism of fire. We live in... New Zealand, New Zeal land. It's prophetic. The sun pretty much rises first in this nation. May New Zealand be known across the globe for a church that has a a new zeal for God, a new passion for Him, a church that's found the zeal of God like never before. It's a prophetic statement, New Zealand. If you're a New Zealander, you should have New Zealand. Zeal. And everyone said? Amen. Okay, let's go to the first way God's going to awaken you and me is repentance, Acts 3, 19. A lot of verses today, so I hope you've got a Bible or iPhone or iPad or computer or anything or a tablet, not a sleeping pill. <laughs> Acts 3, 19. Repent. You know, sometimes people say, someone came up to you and said, repent, you think, hey, leave me alone. No, no. Be delighted. Oh, thank you. You see some sin in my life? Thank you for showing me. Why? Because repent, therefore be converted that your sins may be blotted out. That's good news. 
so that times of refreshing may come. Repentance is a great gift and always leads to more of God in our lives. And we need to allow God to show us areas in our lives that may not be pleasing to Him. There will be some. I've got areas that are not pleasing to Him. Tonight there'll be time for repentance. God, show me. I pray to God He'll show me some stuff. Because then I'll say, okay, God, I repent now. Refreshing, please. And that's the promise of the Word. He will refresh us. Things that are not pleasing. Maybe things that we're watching. Pornography. Maybe our speech. Too much gossip and complaining and criticism. <coughs> Wrong relationships. Or maybe just not serving the God the way we know we should. They're not always bad things you have to repent of. Sometimes it could be a good thing. You know, you're just spending too much time doing this thing here. And it's robbing you of other things that God wants you to focus on. <coughs> Come with me to Isaiah 59 verse 2. Isaiah 59, if you can find Isaiah. Isaiah's a big book, so he's not hard to find. It's going to get tougher soon. Isaiah 59, verse 2, But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. I thank God for the blood of Jesus that cleanses from all sin. But you've got to make sure that you've confessed those sins so he can cleanse you with his blood. The second way that God awakens up is he, God himself stirs up our spirit. I want you to come to Haggai chapter 1. A really, really encouraging verse, I think, for all of us today. Haggai chapter 1. Verse 14 says this. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel. Put your name in there. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Tark. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Sam. And Dennis and Sandy and Steve and all the others. The Lord stirred up the spirit. You know, believe that for yourself. Say, God, stir up my spirit. The spirit of Zerubbabel, the spirit of um, the other guy there, Joshua. <laughs> Is it? Yeah. But not only the leaders, and the spirit of all the people. And what happened? They came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. Wow. Solomon's temple had been destroyed because of disobedience. The people had started to rebuild it, but then they'd stopped partway. They'd lost heart for it. God's house is now lying waste. God stirs up the spirit of trouble, Joshua, all the people, with a passion to build the house of God, a passion to advance the kingdom of God worldwide, a zeal for the work of God. God himself stirred them up. So get ready for God to stir you. Get ready for a fresh awakening. It's on its way. In the margin of my Bible, my study Bible, it says God wakes up the spirit of Zerubbabel. Mm. Interesting, isn't it? God wakes up the spirit of Zerubbabel, which means our spirit can be asleep. Zerubbabel, a leader, a leader in the work of God, spirit asleep. Wow, you think, man, that's amazing. How can it be asleep? See, a, bit, a spirit can be asleep. There's no real hunger to worship with passion. There's no real hunger for the word, for prayer, to serve God, to get into church and be with his people. There's no, no desire to really use our gifts for God. Why is that, friends? Because your spirit's gone to sleep. It's not how it's meant to be. So we can be in church, awake, hopefully, but asleep. Anybody with me? So we've got in this place a whole lot of people who are awake and a whole lot who, well, hopefully not many, but a few that might be asleep. Some people actually fall asleep in a service may actually be awake in the spirit. Don't be... (laughs) Don't be confused. Don't be confused. See, listen, you're created for God, right? By God, for God, to worship Him and serve. How many of you know that? Yeah, that's what you're created for. That's why you're on the planet. That's why you're alive. To love, worship, serve, adore the living God. If you are not experiencing that, your spirit's asleep. The devil's come and given you a sleeping pill. 
and knocked you out. But don't worry, God is ready to wake you up. When you wake up, life begins. Only then does it make sense, gives you purpose and future. Come with me to Ephesians 5.14. It says, therefore, he says, awake you who sleep. So there we are, it's even in the Bible. Awake. Tell the person next to you, awake. Oh, a bit louder than that, they'll never wake up with that. Awake. <laughs> awake you who sleep. <laughs> Some people just probably got the fright of their life. Then what was that about? <laughs> Suddenly woke up. A number of years ago, there was a church in England. Hundreds of young people got on fire for God to tell people about Jesus. Listen, some of them gave up $1 million salaries to go and spread the good news of Jesus. The fire can do that. Preaching probably won't. Commanding won't. Pressure won't. Forcing won't, but the fire, it can do that, friends. Gives people just such a desire to live for Jesus and to serve. That's a wonderful thing, the fire of God. Napoleon once pointed to a map of China, said, there lies a sleeping giant. If it ever wakes up, it will be unstoppable. Our church and other churches, we're like sleeping giants. If we ever fully wake up, we will be unstoppable. The world will receive the message of salvation. Revival fires will break out across the planet and multitudes upon multitudes will come to know Jesus. Ezekiel 37. 37, 1 to 4. The hand of the Lord came upon me, brought me out in the spirit of the Lord, set me down in the midst of the valley and was full of bones. And he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed they were very dry. Say very dry. Very dry. Uh, some of God's people have become very dry. Then he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, oh Lord, you know. Again he said to me, prophesy to these bones. That's what I'm trying to do this morning, actually. And say to them, oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And it's a time for an awakening. It's the word of the Lord. He's go to verse 10. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. That's what happens, friends, when God's awakening comes. That's what happens when the fire of God comes, when the prophetic comes. God awakens a great army of God. They asked John Wesley, Johnny, well, probably not Johnny, Mr. Wesley, how do you get such big crowds? He said, I set myself on fire and people come to watch me burn. Why don't you be a John Wesley? Why don't you set yourself on fire so people come and watch you burn? People are intrigued by the fire of God, friends. They're intrigued. They love it. They may not have it, but they love it. They see it in someone, they're drawn to it like magnets. Third way that God awakens us is through prophecy. God stirs up people through his prophets. So let's go to Haggai now, a minor prophet. Haggai 1, 3 to 7. Haggai 1, 3 to 7. It says this, Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider... Your ways. And I'm asking you and me today, consider our ways. See, what had happened here is the people had got sidetracked. And they'd now become more focused on their own lives and building their own homes, which is nothing wrong with. But they were more focused on that while the house of God lay waste. There were needs in God's house. There were needs in the work of God that weren't being attended to because people's attention had got into their own houses. Now, if they were doing both, it probably wouldn't matter. They were giving God second best. He wasn't first in their hearts. We need to consider our ways, that our own homes and lives don't become more important than God's house. 
Make sure he's getting the best of your time, the best of your energy, the best of your love, the best of your talents. Don't give them to the world. Give them to God, first and foremost. I want to encourage you today to guard against excessive debt and mortgages in order to get your dream home or to get a home, to get a car that you want or an OE. Because we can get into so much debt. Do you know what happens? We fall asleep spiritually. Because we have to spend so much energy and time reducing our debt. And we need to make sure that building God's house, serving Him is always the top priority. We probably all know of people, you probably know of people, that they were just average Christians going along, and suddenly they're transformed. Suddenly they're awake, suddenly they're wanting to serve, and they want to be in church, and there are prayer meetings and all the rest of it. You think, my goodness, what on earth happened to them? Well, guess what happened, friends? God stirred them up. He gave them an awakening, and they were aroused, and even unknown to themselves, they probably can't even make sense of it. Suddenly they just, they just want to be all about God. And you think, wow, that is my friends, that's for everyone. That's not just for one or two people, that's for every person that's ordered on. Don't let the devil lie to you and say, oh, that was for so-and-so and so-and-so. No, it's for you. It's for me, it's for all of us. New fire, new awakening, new passion for Jesus. I'm in for more. Anyone with me today? You know, when Cyrus gave the decree to rebuild the temple, he said, okay, Jews, you can go back and rebuild the temple. Not even responded. Many preferred to remain in the luxury of Babylon where they were enjoying life. So even when God begins to stir, some people say, no, no, no thanks. I'm content, I'm happy doing my thing. Leave me alone, God, please. Some people honestly think that way. And it's true, that's what happened there. They were just enjoying, they were content to be where they're at. And they were not wanting to respond to God's stirring. Friends, it is a massive privilege to respond when God stirs you and to get a new passion and a new fire for God. But with God's help, we can tend to the fire in our hearts. It is time for a fresh encounter. It's time for an awakening. It's time for God to fill his temple and your temple with his glory. Awakening, fire for God, passion. I guess that's probably one of my life messages that I've been given to share and tell others about. Next week, I'm going to continue with this theme and show you more ways that you can possess and have a greater fire and passion for God in your life. I'm sure you'll find the message very inspiring and helpful. We'd love to join with you in prayer. Why don't you send us your prayer requests via the website on the screen and we'll get our intercessors to pray personally and individually for you, believing for your miracle. Join me again next week. Thanks for watching Running With Fire with Tark Barna from Church Unlimited. For more great free content, visit runningwithfire.com. You can send us your prayer requests, stream online TV and radio episodes, and view blog articles. You can also connect with Tark Barna through Twitter for regular updates. Church Unlimited meets at two locations in Auckland, New Zealand. You're welcome to come along for a visit.